Please take your Bibles and I'm turning to Mark chapter 12 and I'm reading from verse 18 to 27. Some Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection came to Jesus and began questioning him saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. There were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died, leaving no children. The second one married her and died, leaving behind no children, and likewise the third. And so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are mistaken? that you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. As we open our Bibles and read from Mark chapter 12, we realize John Mark is quickly bringing us to the conclusion of Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus has intently led his disciples in the direction of Jerusalem, having passed through Jericho, where he healed the blind beggar Bartimaeus. On coming to Jerusalem, Jesus entered the city of the great king, amid the loud shouts of praise and a great eyebrow-raising commotion in fulfillment of Psalm 118, verse 26. The stage is now set for the final confrontations Jesus would have with various groups ending in his crucifixion. First, Jesus comes into the temple and drives out the money changers and those who were peddling their religious wares in the temple courts, Jesus declares that the temple was to be a house of prayer for all the nations, but these men had turned it into a robber's den. The chief priests and the scribes, who were taking a cut of the earnings, would have gladly destroyed Jesus, but because they were fearful of the crowd, they held off for the moment. Jesus is later questioned about his authority by the chief priests, scribes, and elders. He offers to answer their question pertaining to authority if they will first plainly say, what they thought about John the Baptist's ministry. These men actually thought very little of John's wilderness ministry, but again, fearing the people who thought the world of John, they couldn't express their thoughts aloud. So they simply said, we don't know. And Jesus responded, then I can't help you either. But the challenges continue in Mark chapter 12. Mark records the parable of the vine growers, what I have called the parable 
of the wretched renters, you will recall we had a close look at that parable three Sundays ago as we came to Matthew chapter 21, the parallel to how it's recorded here in Mark. The religious leaders knew Jesus was directing the parable straight at them, and they were smarting from the invisible lash he had used. Some Pharisees and Herodians, two very different groups united only in their disdain for Jesus, stepped forward thinking that they could publicly embarrass Jesus. They question him about tax to Caesar, but Jesus answers their question with wisdom that surpassed that of the mighty King Solomon a thousand years before. Then, some Sadducees come to Jesus with what they surely considered a straitjacket from which no one could ever escape. First, let's consider who is asking the question. We frequently hear mention of the Sadducees in the Gospels, and here, John Mark gives the comment that these men say there is no resurrection. We often hear of the Sadducees paired with the Pharisees, but I assure you that they were by no means on friendly terms. One of the most outstanding glimpses into the divide between the Sadducees and the Pharisees can be found in Acts chapter 23, where Paul has been brought up before the council, the council, that is the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, to answer for his conduct. This council was comprised of both Sadducees and Pharisees, as Acts chapter 23, verse 6 says, Paul, believing that a fair trial would surely be held right before his hanging, also believes that drastic measures are called for. He cries out that he is on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. The fat is instantly in the fire. For the Sadducees say there isn't a resurrection, and the Pharisees say there most definitely, most certainly is. Furthermore, the Sadducees say, say there are no angels, no spirits, and no scripture beyond the five books of Moses. But the Pharisees believe in angels, spirits, and the entire Old Testament as we have it in our Bibles. That council meeting is turned into a shouting match, and all order goes out the window in the heated arguments which ensue. We also remember the Sadducees were part of the establishment in Jerusalem and were tightly attached to the temple and the temple service and ceremony. The Pharisees were typically wandering moral teachers who were not linked in the same way to Jerusalem. As a result, the Sadducees were often looked on with suspicion as having sold out to the Romans in order to maintain their place, and the privileges that went along with that. Some of these Sadducees, these ones who say there is no resurrection, approach Jesus now with a story and a question about the resurrection. Remember that their authority base, their scriptures, are limited to the five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible called the books of Moses. And strangely, they go into what they claimed to believe for their ammunition. 
Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 5 is quoted here in verse 19. But then they extrapolate a tragic family situation where there were seven weddings and eight funerals. I'm a little bit glad that this family wasn't a part of my congregation. Over 20 years ago now, for whatever reason, a particular family latched on to me, and I forget how many family weddings I officiated for them as sibling after sibling came to the altar for matrimony. But it certainly wasn't seven. And I have yet to assist them with any funerals at all. One preacher referred to this family as genetically impoverished. Seven brothers in the family, and the oldest takes a wife, but dies and leaves no child. Just as soon as the mourner's clothes are put away, out comes the wedding canopy again. The second brother marries the widow, but alas, death comes to claim the man, and no child is conceived. Back and forth this family rocks through the coming weeks and months until successively all of the brothers are briefly married to the woman. What a ride it would have been between celebration and grief. Son number seven marries and dies childless, just like all of his brothers, never figuring out that it was likely the woman's cooking that was the end of them. As, which, as, as with each of them, the youngest is carried off, and this highly experienced widow again marches to the cemetery over the path that she knows as well as anything in life. Last of all, funeral number eight. The day comes when the woman does not walk into the cemetery, but is carried, for she herself has died and is laid to rest in what is now a very large family plot indeed. In the um, <clears throat> resurrection, Jesus, that time when the dead are mysteriously and supposedly to somehow live again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. I'm sure they attempted to keep a serious look on their face, but deep down the belly laugh probably started to erupt and started to make them tremble. Jesus, however, is not befuddled. As with the question of the Pharisees and the Herodians over the tax to Caesar, he received the error, he perceived the error of their way perfectly. Jesus says, you're mistaken. You're clueless. And here's the reason. You have missed the mark on two counts. First, you don't understand the scriptures. That was quite a slam. These would have been some of the most well-educated leaders of the day, and not just educated in their Aram Hebrew and Aramaic, Aleph, Beth, and Gimel, but in very extensive scriptural study. They knew a lot, but it is possible to be educated beyond your intelligence. There was data they had stored between their ears, but they were unable to comprehend the information they had memorized. There was a lack of understanding of what the scriptures 
actually meant. Secondly, these men did not understand the power of God. Many years ago, J.B. Phillips wrote a book, Your God is Too Small. Great title. It certainly could have been dedicated to these Pharisees, to, the, to these Sadducees. However, it wasn't that God was actually small, but that their understanding of God, who God truly is and what he can do was puny and pathetic. Puny and pathetic. Mistaken. Lacking understanding on two vital counts. Their tunnel vision caused them to miss out on the plan and power and beauty of God. But Jesus was not going to simply belittle them and leave it there as they had hoped to do with him. No, he, having dwelt in heaven for eternity past, knew exactly the plan of God and the condition in which we will dwell for all the ages to come. In the resurrection, and Jesus doesn't blink for a millisecond on that, we are ushered into a place in which we are like or similar to angels in this one aspect. We do not marry. We do not become angels, but in this one department, we share this condition. Then Jesus says, but regarding the fact, F-A-C-T, the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses? Jesus didn't take them to an Old Testament passage that they could easily brush off as lacking authority. He knew where to go. He knew where to find something that would really grab their attention and that they would be unable to escape from. He goes to Moses. He takes them straight to their own copy of the Bible he isn't here making a comment on what is or isn't a part of the authoritative Old Testament. He takes them to their own readily admitted scriptures and says, Look, if you think I'm foolish for believing in a resurrection, you need to realize how foolish you are for not believing in it, for it is right under your nose. Perhaps that was part of the problem. So Jesus lifts it up and holds Exodus chapter 3, verse 6 to their eyes and shows them where God is speaking to Moses at the bush that strangely was not consumed. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. God doesn't say, I was the God of Abram. But that was before he up and died and he is never to be seen again forever. And I was the God of Isaac, but he died as did Jacob. Dead, buried, gone. Guys, Jesus is saying, haven't you read this? Surely you have in all of the classes you have sat through as pupils. Surely you have instructed others again and again. Has it not registered? Don't you see it? Don't you understand what the scriptures plainly declare? And don't you see that the power of God is so very much more than just a fascinating trick in the desert, a bush that burns and burns and burns. The power of God is more than sufficient that the dead shall live again. 
Jesus declares he, God, is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And he ends with, you are greatly mistaken. They hadn't just missed the mark a little bit, but he is saying, you are so far off the mark, you've missed the target absolutely and completely as though you were shooting in the opposite direction of the mark. You are greatly mistaken. You are greatly off the mark. Does it matter if there is a resurrection? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what we call the resurrection chapter, Paul says in the loudest terms, yes. He says, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are, of all men, most to be pitied and the most pathetic of all. He says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die, and then it's all over. There is nothing more for us. If this life is all there is, then you have to make the very most of it because you only go round once. And right there, you could take a snapshot of the Sadducees and paste it right there beside that very declaration. Let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. This life was all that they were expecting, and so they were going to grab all of the pomp, the power, prestige, and privilege they could get their hands on because they were only going around once. What a horrible way to live. They had excluded themselves from the commonwealth of Israel and had become strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. As the Apostle Paul declared to the Ephesians, Gentiles, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, those who had come to Christ, what they were like before they had come to Christ. Here these Sadducees, they had excluded themselves from the true privileges of God, and they had become strangers to the promises of God, and as a result, no hope and no God in the world. Let me hold out for you a better way. I just re read for you how that the Apostle Paul referenced 1 Corinthians chapter 15 of the resurrection. He also speaks in Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. If the spirit, the Sadducees didn't think there was a spirit, but Paul Without any hesitation, he says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus, so right in the opening words of that, sent, of that verse, Paul is saying, spirit and resurrection. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, he is the same one who is able to transform lives and to bring us to true and abundant life. Our God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus himself, in John chapter 10, and verse 10, said, I am come that they might have life and have it abundantly. 
God is not the God of the dead, but he is the God of the living. For he is the one who comes to the dead, the spiritually dead, and he bids us to live. He is the one who imparts into us life such as what we have never known and life such as what we could never hope to know by any other means. He is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. Why? Because he has come and he has imparted life to us that we might truly and genuinely live through the power that he brings to us. Lord, we give you thanks and praise that there is indeed a resurrection for us to look forward to and to anticipate. And I pray for every man and woman who hears my voice, that they would understand the glorious privilege and the glorious opportunities that you hold out to us so work in our hearts and may we understand the vast, incredible power of God that is at work within us. Hear us, Lord, and work your will and draw us ever closer to yourself. These mercies we ask in Jesus' name, amen.